At the end of this, Andrew, who is running marketing, will come up with questions in Q&A and Q &A, bring them to our attention. So with that being said, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Rubin. I'm the CEO of Scubana. Happen to also be a top uh, Amazon seller along with many other channels. I'm joined today with... Jason McGee, uh, head of uh, new partnerships at World First. So he, Jason flew a special from Austin, Texas, which is one of my favorite places in the United States. Best city in the world. <laughs> and he flew a special to actually do this live in person with everybody today. And so we are uh, super appreciative that you joined us for one hour. And I'm sure it's hot all over the United States right now. It's certainly hot here on the East Coast. Yeah, it is a little bit. <laughs> Uh, and so thank you so much for joining us. And so today we're going to be talking about how to take your business to a global level. Uh, Jason happens to be an expert uh, internationally and in taking sellers internationally. And I also happen to be selling internationally. So we yeah. thought we'd regroup together and uh, rock out with some gold nuggets. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're, we're talking all about different Amazon ha hacks, basically, mm -hmm. if you're selling internationally. So you, yeah. you have from experience, I mean, you're a client of ours too, even on the crucial side. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so we got the name, the ten, at least for me, I came up with the name 10 Hack Commandments because of yeah. the Biggie Smalls version, which is the 10 Crack Commandments. Hack is a little bit more PG. We can do that. So uh, there is a link here if you want to share this with anybody. Please feel free to share them to get them onto this webinar. And so here we are, 10 hacks to help you win. Jason and I both collaborated, uh, collaborated on what we want to share with you today. So... Even if you've never gone internationally, now is the time. Every passing moment is a chance to turn it all around, and now you can start entering into uh, abroad or overseas waters very, very quickly. Yeah, and I think we're talking a lot about Amazon here because it's typically the, the first uh, channel you go international with. So mm -hmm. obviously a lot of these you can even apply to other marketplaces too, but you know, Amazon's the big elephant in the room. That's why we're here today, most of us anyway, so we'll focus on that. Exactly. So without further ado, there we go. So here's our here's our goal is that we want to get people who have never sold internationally to start selling internationally. But not only do we want you to sell internationally, we want you to dominate internationally. Mm -hmm. And so for us, if we can get you to walk away with anything through this presentation is domination and how to win overseas. Yeah, especially everybody who's already internationally. The, the nuggets you guys can directly apply to your business today. So it's uh, yeah, a lot of good things to cover. Cool. So uh, feel free to put any Q and A in the chat box. Andrew will come around with some Q and A with some questions with us, and uh, we'll, we'll rock those out at the end. So stay tuned. We also have a special offer from both myself and World First at the end. So stay tuned. Okay. So. Hack commandments, we got the number one up. Jason? Uh, yeah, so if you're selling internationally, let's say you're based in the US and selling on Amazon in the UK or vice versa, first hack we're talking about is if you're using Amazon's auto convert, uh, Amazon's currency converter services to send your money back home, if you don't know how you're moving your money and Amazon just deposits it, that's what you're using. Uh, so, how can you save money without spending a dime to set it up? So, Chad, number one, uh, Amazon can pay back to certain markets uh, without requiring a country equivalent of a bank account. Mm -hmm. So, if you're selling in the UK and Amazon's sending your money right back to the US for you, uh, they're definitely not doing it for free. So, so what do they take? So, so you, what is the take rate that Amazon takes when they convert back? Exactly. So, you, prime example, your own business when you were doing it before you used us, it was about 4%. You guys hear that? 4%, Amazon takes 4% to do the currency. So not only do they take your 15% off the top, mm -hmm. you're taking 4% in the FBA fees, commissions, etc. And you never see it. It's not a separate line item. They'll say, okay, well, here's how many pounds you sold. Oh, here's how many dollars you'll get. When you can just you know do a simple Google search and see what the exchange rate is. Our clients, you being one of them, we saw it, you know, 3.75 to over 4%. Off the top, every single time you make a disbursement. But the hack is... You don't have to do that. Like it's it's uh, you, you can use a service like World First. There's others out there too. But plugging in the equivalent of an in-country account uh, that's located in the UK uh, that collects those revenues for for free, and then when you bring them back home, companies like World First will at least cut that in half. Got so, it. So they create a bank account, and boom, 
you know, the, the currency conversion happens. Yep, yeah, exactly. So uh, you know, you're able to go right into Seller Central, uh, put this account in. Like I said, free to set up. And I think the big nugget here is you can imagine whatever, apply whatever GMB you're using, but you're selling right now. Imagine putting two percent every disbursement, if not more, depending on your volume, back without spending a dime to set it up, and you can you know set it, forget it. And quick question: Is it possible yet for me to actually not send that money back home, but have a debit card? In pounds and just go shopping in the UK with that money. Yeah. Well, so we we actually are uh, there. There are a few things that we just released. Uh, we just announced it, like a world account. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, we're gonna be sending some more information about that. But folks have the ability uh, in certain cases to actually pay suppliers uh, who are in the UK or, or other places in the world too. So you have the ability to have a lot more functionality with these accounts. Cool. So yeah, awesome. that's a, yeah, really good news. So next one, locking in exchange rates can secure your profit margin. Yeah, so uh, the one-on-one level is, hey, let me just go ahead and take whatever, and just use world first as opposed to Amazon. Well, what folks don't realize, it's not just saving money in a good exchange rate, you actually can lock in exchange rates. So they're called forward contracts. Forward contract. So what that means is, let's say you're, you sell uh, $100,000 um, a month. Mm -hmm. You could lock in an exchange rate, let's say you wanted to lock in $600,000 for six months. You can just wait and then once that, and you're guaranteed that exchange rate. So you can wait and use it all at that one time or you can do a flexible forward. Now how do you know? So yeah, just talk to me how my team who has no idea about currency fluctuations, mm -hmm. how do they anticipate if it's going to go up or down if they're locking in the right rate? Well, see, look, nobody has a crystal ball, but mm -hmm. companies like what we do is we talk to every client about what an exchange rate means like, and why it fluctuates. Okay. So there's two reasons you might want to lock one in. Let, here's an example, Macron, probably butchering his name, just got elected uh, uh, the, the head of France. Mm -hmm. When that happened, the, the euro actually strengthened compared to the dollar because they're keeping the European Union together. So that means every single time you bring your euros back to dollars, you're bringing more money home just because of the fluctuation. So two things. One, when it's favorable like that, you can lock in for a small window of time or a longer window of time, and you're guaranteed that increased profit margin. Mm -hmm. But some folks don't even want to think of about how it's going to go up or down. They're like, look, I just want to have a guaranteed profit margin. I don't care whether it's high or low. When I'm selling over the next three months, I want to know exactly how much my euros will, will convert back into dollars. So sometimes we'll get to the next hack, but it's a, you know, you can take advantage of exchange rates in your favor, but some folks just like the guarantee. Kind of like having a fixed cost of a profit margin when you bring it back up. So with your, your guys out there, that's the whole point of having like a world first dedicated dealer talking to a client. So I think. Kristen, who works directly with us on your side, uh, we're talking to her uh, by email, by phone. She calls us, we call her, letting her know what's going on. So she's always in the know. Cool, cool. All right. Oops, skipped one. All right. So we, we touched on this a little bit, but optimizing your profit margin by taking advantage of favorable exchange rates. Yeah. So. We mentioned a little bit before. So when you can lock in for a set amount of time when, when it when it's good, that's one way to profit. And you know when it's good because you have a team of like currency yeah. people. It, yeah, exactly. We have a team. Everybody gets a dedicated deal and they talk about where 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 the market was, where it is now. Like I said, we can't tell you which way it's going to go. We don't have a crystal ball, but we provide you all the facts and what you know experts are saying mm -hmm. in terms of okay, well, this person uh, is expected to get elected. Here's yeah. here's what would. It's all about timing, though. I mean, you can show a graph of where where the currency was and where it is today, mm -hmm. and you can try to make a call. Now, sort of yeah, so we won't make a call. But we, you yeah, make a call. My yeah, we we people. want we want to give you guys all the info you can have, so mm -hmm. you make an educated decision. Yeah. Okay. So it's about making you guys like let us be your eyes and ears and show you what's going on, so you guys can make a decision. But the second thing is is if you're using Amazon, Amazon will send your money back home on a schedule, the same day, every two weeks, whatever it is, whatever your dispersing mechanism is. With World First, once the funds hit your World First account, you have control over the time. So it doesn't have to be that same day. You can wait, you could, uh, even if you just did it at the market rate at the day, which is a spot rate, you don't have to do it. You can, the way, if you do it at noon compared to 3 p.m., that could have an effect. Sure. So just you know, having uh, either your eyes on it or let us do that work for you. You can even set up custom alerts. Yeah, I mean we we live in the information age, so you don't have to like rely on you know you know Amazon in this case. So you can just take advantage of when when it's in your favor. Awesome, awesome. And again, 
And please feel free to drop Q and A. If you have any Q and A for us, we'll get to it at the end. So just put it into the chat box. Maybe give us a shout out. Yeah. Tell us where you're dialing in from. Yeah, All you're right. from Austin out there. I want to know. <laughs> yeah, you're from Austin. You can actually go hang out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We just got a brand new office. It's uh, yeah, it's really cool. So, so it's different from the place that I came to. Yeah, visit. yeah, man. Uh, we just moved in uh, probably a month or so ago. A lot more space. Uh, things are good. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. So, oh, yeah. That's number four. Oh yeah, this is actually a pretty cool one. Um, I think they're all cool, but I'm kind of nerdy. So, in terms of leveraging exchange rate fluctuations, so here is a really cool example using the France example. So, uh, they Macron gets elected, the euro strengthens. Let's just say for number's sake that the euro strengthened three percent compared to the dollar. Now, here's the thing: you could do nothing, don't change your business at all, and just make an immediate three percent more of your profit. But what if you lowered your price three percent? What does that do? You're still maintaining your exact same profitability level because of the fluctuation. Now, what if that actually allows you to win the buy box and you know drive increase sales velocity? So, yeah, yeah actually, like whether you're repricing yourself if you're private label or use a repricer for private label, or you're a reseller and you're using a repricer, these are just things that you can you know just pay attention to. And there, are, you know, there's so many ways that you can just be just a little bit more mindful and, and make money. So, cool. All right, this is a fun one. I'll take this one. So how you could get a discount on your invoice when paying overseas suppliers. Yeah, I think this happened to you directly, right? Yeah, uh, so let's go through it. So let's take, so right now, if you're sourcing product yourself, you're gonna be buying from say Alibaba, maybe you'll be buying a small minimum quantity from AliExpress in smaller quantities. This is a way to actually tell if your pricing is good. So without having to contact 100 different companies on Alibaba, and then contact another hundred that are gold. Yeah. Gold members of Alibaba. Yeah. yeah. You can use, and we're gonna to get to it, 1688. But let's first translate from English into Chinese, mm -hmm. simplify Chinese, the traditional Chinese. So Doglish translated, boom, you have a screenshot on the screen. So take that translation and put it into 1688.com. 1688.com is pretty much the Chinese version of Alibaba. In fact, a lot of people in Alibaba that are trading companies mm -hmm. are buying from companies that are on 1688. Really? And most people in the United States don't even know about 1688. So you can't use English, really. You'll get uh, much more narrow results if you use English. But if you actually translate into the native language, Chinese, yeah. simplified, put it into 1688, now your products come up. And so the product will come up with your variations of what you want, but they'll also tell you how many are available, but also if you buy more, what your pricing will be, which is pretty sweet. So they give you your pricing, and now, and they give you the price in RevMD. Yeah. Now we're gonna convert it back into yeah, US dollars, yeah. which you can see on the screen here, you can use Google uh, currency conversion. So we're translating it back, which gives you a baseline of what to compare your price you're getting from either someone on Alibaba or even someone, a sourcing agent that you're using versus what is being offered in China currently right now. So it's the wholesale version of Alibaba in China. So how did you find out about that? Uh, by hustling. hustling. <laughs> Pretty much by hustling, right? By learning and by doing, you actually can experience this and you can catch your suppliers Lying about price or baking oh, in wow. margins, so well, it helps you achieve higher margins instantaneously. Yeah, hit back real quick. Because yeah, one of the, that's awesome. Uh, number one, I mean, that's something that nobody's doing, and yeah, I had no idea, and I, I feel like I have a pretty good ear to figure out what's going on. So, mm -hmm. I think another thing that's really cool too is regardless of whether you're sort where you're sourcing from, especially like China, for instance. Let's say your 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 supplier is in China or they're in mainland Europe. A lot of times, they'll still price you in dollars. So a lot of times when you get an invoice, you see your invoice in dollars, ask them for that invoice in local currency as well. Say, hey, if I were to convert and just pay you local currency, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, we've seen a lot of our clients, they actually, they see that their suppliers bake in another three, five, even 10% uh, just because uh, they're pricing you in dollars. So companies like World First and others out there, I mean, worst case scenario, you can still use a bank to do it. Um, 
you actually would just go to them and convert back to uh, actually make a US dollar to remedy payment. And you can save three, five, ten percent on your on your supply. So I think you need to hack that's coming up. Oh, is it? But anyway, <laughs> we follow on in that hack. Yeah. So we actually just made a decision to start uh, paying our suppliers a remedy. Yeah. So I think we talked about this maybe a couple months ago. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. At our conference, and we made a strategic decision to start paying them a remedy on yeah. their local currency. Yeah. This year to date, eighty thousand dollars in savings. So those from our conversation. From our conversation. <laughs> That's now, some ROI on that nugget. We've been following currency throughout this entire time to yeah. see like where we were going to land. Yeah. And that's what we implemented here. So we'll create purchase orders uh, using Skibana, of course, and then we'll have QuickBooks, which converts yeah. into Remin B, right? My bookkeeper does all of that. Well, we yeah, it calculates what it is. They yeah. do, the, they do the, the numbers on it. Exactly. Yeah. So that is, that is a juicy nugget. So wow. thank you for sharing. Yeah. The other, the other thing I want to talk about while we're talking about buying from suppliers in China, and I, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that have the same issue where they'll say, my mints are too high, or yeah. the, the, they're making me buy 5,000 at a time. Your MOQs. Are MOQ, yeah, exactly, the MOQs. So what you can do is you say, screw you, we're not doing an MOQ, but what can you do to support us? What can you do to support my business as we grow? So the MOQs are just made up numbers that they want to actually yeah. grow this higher dollar value in their pocket. Of course. So you can say, look, you gave us 5,000 MOQ, here's our offer. We're going to buy 500. And we'll hop onto another production run of another company that's producing the material so that you're doing it simultaneously on that production run. Yeah. So MOQs are just artificial numbers that are made up for them for you to buy more. So Let's just say that that five thousand example, well, five thousand MOQ. You have uh, you're trying to get five hundred. Mm -hmm. Does the does it work to say, hey, look, given it's my first time working with you, I just want to see the quality, so I, I, I need lower. Yeah, you can do that. Also, you can say, look, I want you to support my business. There's a lot more business to be had. Yeah. So then maybe they won't hit you with five hundred. Yeah. Maybe they'll come up to seven fifty. Maybe they'll come to a thousand. But at least you're not forced to buy five thousand where you're deploying cash and just sitting there and dreaming from your business. Yeah. Because like you're not going to, as a private labeler or as a person that's building a brand, you're not going to hit a home run every time. Yeah. Well, that's it. I feel like the first run of products, if you, especially if you're testing, and we'll talk about testing in a little bit too, but it's not about being profitable. Like you can think, all right, forget about this first run being profitable. I know what scale looks like. I know what my numbers are. I know the margin's going to be. It's just about, yeah, testing it, see the sales velocity. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think another one too, it's just like, there's that saying, I think you've been there before, you know? Um, so I think a lot of times when, when uh, companies, uh, individuals, whatever, however you run your Amazon business, if you actually go direct to the supplier and you just act like you've been there before, oh, like, oh you know what? I have multi-million dollar business in another line. First time trying this line, work with me here. I get you don't like the MOQ and how few I want, but look, I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. Let's just try it out. Yep. So I, guess, I think the point that you're talking, you mentioned earlier is just hustling. Just trying different things, seeing what's working. Like, why don't you say, like, hey, why don't you ask why? Like, MOQ, well, why is it really an MOQ? You know, sure. like, just questioning everything and being willing to try something different. Or saying, hey, let's hop on a production line. Or yeah, yeah. perhaps let's actually airship something. So, oh, you're getting, you're getting us a sample. You're going to make a sample special for us. Great. Send me 50 samples. I'll yeah. pay a little more for those samples. Yeah, they're airship. Yeah, it's a, Boom. Yeah. Done. You're actually quicker to market. Meanwhile, as we start seeing velocity happen, then you have a shipment coming over uh, by sea. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you're not worried about that first shipment, whether you're going to make a ton of money on it. It's like, all right, is it selling? And then you know, like, not every shipment's going to cost so much to send to you because you're you're not going to ship it by air every time. Exactly. Wow. That's, yeah. The that's goal funny. here, guys, is to drop as much nuggets for you to actually walk away with valuable information for you to bring back into your company. So if you can walk away with five things from this, or even one thing that moves the needle for your business, yeah. this is a success. The price of admission and the price of admission is for free. Absolutely. All right. So here's another thing. Uh, this is hack number six. Uh, so a lot of people are like, well, how do I actually build a logistics infrastructure overseas? And my, my, what I share with them is, well, you don't need to build a logistics infrastructure. You can actually use Amazon's FBA warehouse mm -hmm. internationally and ship it to your off-channel customers and also just have your on-channel Amazon customers as well. Yeah. So 
uh, one of the things that we guide our customers to is to actually using Subana, and you can see on the left hand side here, all the different warehouses that you can have for Amazon US, Amazon FBA, uh, Canada, UK, Mexico, and you can use those facilities as a warehouse to ship off channel. So yeah. uh, one of the things I want to mention, I think it's coming up in the next slide, is that eBay is larger in the UK than Amazon UK. Yeah. Right now. Mm -hmm. The time of recording this webinar. And so you can get a ton of traction eBay.co.uk using your Amazon FBA inventory as a logistics center as a 3PL and outsourced warehouse oh, yeah. to ship it off channel. Mm -hmm. One other nugget to mention on this, on this webinar is the fact that Amazon Germany is larger than Amazon UK. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. So going back to the eBay point, uh, a lot of marketplaces, they say they don't want to have Amazon to fill in orders for them, but the fact of the matter is they'll let it happen. So I'm, I don't want to you know, drop a name of any of that. I, I can't 100% say that they, they do it. I need mean, a lot of U.S. ones, too. Um, like I have Groupon, for instance. Like you can sell on, on Groupon goods and Groupon stores and have Amazon have pay fulfill it. Yep. And same thing in Europe as well. Like other places, see discounts in other places, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's Maybe I can try and share a list with, with the audience afterwards, too. But, yeah, you can use your Amazon warehouse to ship it. So, yeah, and so we integrate to Groupon, we integrate to, to eBay, yeah. and so you can actually have the orders flow in from Groupon or from eBay, mm -hmm. they get uploaded into Amazon's warehouse, Amazon drops and track and drops inventory, boom, we send it, sends it right on out. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. And the other one, so back with uh, Amazon Germany and the UK, I guess the other, the other power tip, uh, you're right, is it's bigger, but you got to realize that the way the, the buyer behavior works is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. you just got to make sure you're kind of set up for it. So, I think the Germans, for instance, let's just say you're getting um, like a phone case. Um, the the re rate of returns on Amazon UK is not very high, but you go to Germany, they'll buy five colors, five cases, different colors, just to try on the color they like and then return the mm -hmm. other the other four. Yeah, I never heard that. Before. Yeah, so um, obviously it's bigger, and especially um, you know it's it's a really 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 good sophisticated market. But just be mindful that uh, if you have a good warehouse and return system too. Um, or if you don't, you know, it can hurt you knowing that they, they return a lot more. I think right. the return. That could be because like their model is like Imer Besser always focused on improving like their engineering. Always the machine, man. Yeah. They care. I think they really care about quality products. And so if you're going to ship them garbage from China, like you're going to get a return. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's also like how they buy it too. Like the, the Brits are so much further in using mobile than we are. So I know Amazon does a good job of making listings mobile friendly too, but anything you can do on top of that to make your listing a little bit more mobile friendly will increase your sales velocity, or it could anyways, uh, just because I mean, it's really, really high the percentage you're using mobile to buy. Yeah, so that's an important point. This is off topic, but if you're trying to build quality of listings, I think when you're on mobile, Amazon only shows you the first 18 characters of the listing yeah. title. So as you're scrolling down, make sure your first 18 characters are yeah. legit and quality. Well, and going really off topic as well, but kind of down this rabbit hole. All right, we're so, all right. Yeah, right? Now, who's going to tell us now? Um, so on the, uh, like the Google, the way Google search engine works too is, um, let's say you write a press release. Um, the first, you know, 20 to 40 characters are the most important of that press release. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say for sure, but I've seen similar things happen with Amazon as well. Like Amazon, especially, uh, their, how Amazon's uh, listings work too. If you're packing in, Quality keywords towards the front of listings. I've, I've my clients have seen that they actually are, are you know those those characters are the most impactful. Hmm. So, all right, move on to the next tab here. Ah, uh, yes. So this is one that I have a personal share with. So uh, I now do have my product in FBA facilities in the UK uh, and in Canada, but we have a third party warehouse that we've outsourced mm -hmm. located in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Our storage fees are in euros, right? Yeah. Our labor is in euros, but we're actually leveraging uh, the ecosystem in Europe to ship into the UK and get paid in pounds. Mm -hmm. So we get paid, uh, we pay in euros and we receive in pounds sterling. So it's just a way to arbitrage labor, yeah. storage, and also they're much more connected in this 3PL to all the different marketplaces. Oh, yeah. see, so they introduced us to all these other marketplaces yeah. that we can actually have our products beyond. Because like Amazon's big, but if you look scattered over Europe, there's tons of other marketplaces. Oh, my goodness. I mean, see this kind of France is one of that, that, that comes, uh, I mean, they, a lot of folks even have better sales velocity and see this than they do Amazon, or at least comparable. Mm -hmm. so in, 
Yeah, and they, they actually have their own Amazon FBA sort of system. I think you can also allow FBA to fulfill orders there as well. That's a, that's a really good one. Yeah, and there's also a tax, uh, there's a, some tax advantages to having a warehouse in Ireland versus having a warehouse in the UK. Uh, much, much lower tax rates to incentivize small businesses to go there. I think the tax rate right now is about 80 percent corporate. Really? So, whereas in the United States, it's uh, 30, 30, uh, 35%. Yeah. So, So yeah, labor and currency arbitrage, you pay in the euro, ship in pounds. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we were talking about, I think you alluded to this yep. uh, previously, is translating your listings to win internationally. So this is a mistake that I think a lot of people make. I, I just want to point out that selling international is more difficult, right? There's more that needs to happen. It's not your native tongue, it's not your native country. Yeah. It just It's more difficult, it's more of a struggle but it's also less crowded. Oh yeah, yeah. So part of what I, like my mindset is like, in order to win in business, you have to do things that others are not willing to do. Yeah, what's, what's that, that saying too, is like to have, do things that folks aren't willing to do to have the things that folks, uh, other folks don't, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is I like, uh, I, I like when uh, folks talk about how hard it is to sell internationally because that just, uh, all of our clients, and you know, it, they're those guys who are the ones winning. These guys are overcoming everything. And that's the thing, too, is putting up sort of blinders. Like, yeah, a lot of stuff gets thrown at you. And so many times you can say no. And, like, oh, I'm not going to sell this product. Or I'm not going to sell there. But, I mean, don't make rash decisions, you know? And just, like, actually just, like, have a plan, stick to it, and just kind of block out the noise. Yep. So, like, there's 2 million sellers right now currently on Amazon US market. Mm -hmm. And when I go to events and I speak and I ask people who here is selling internationally, you have like a small, small percentage, which are probably the winners yeah. that are actually overseas selling their actions. Yeah. They're willing to do things that others aren't willing to do. And so the losers in the U.S. are, are complaining that it's too crowded. It's like, okay, well, I get it. Like, it's crowded. Like, heavy lives are crowded in the U.S. It's a good market for everybody. What are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah and that's, yeah. So, so like, when you're that's building your listing, it's important to actually get, uh, so, like, the dog jumps over the fence. If you actually translate that, Using Google's translation system and then translate it back into English, mm -hmm. it's actually not correct. Yeah, not so at all. Don't try and do it on your own. Exactly. So I guess the point that that hat is that you don't want to use robots or Google Translate to do your listings. Yeah. See if you can get somebody native to do your listings for you. Mm -hmm. On Germany, clearly like the lowest hanging fruit is Canada, is UK. Mm -hmm. But if you're going into Germany, make sure you have a person actually do your listing conversion. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at even the UK. So we call. Tennis shoes, tennis shoes, they call them trainers. Yep. Like uh, jackets, uh, you know, sweaters versus jumpers. Vacuums, right? Yeah. In America, we call it a vacuum cleaner. There, they call it a Hoover. Yeah. And Hoover's a brand in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. See, that, there's things that, like, that's the things, like, you just, you gotta pay attention to the small stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely an important one. So here's one that I've been playing with a little bit is, so right now, currently what we do is we import it in, we have the FBA, we have the inventory coming to the United States, and then we have our warehouse doing our prep. Yeah. Kids, bundles, and prep is happening in the United States with U.S. labor, mm -hmm. and then we ship it to FBA. So I've been trying to get my team around the idea of having our vendors ship direct to FBA. Mm -hmm. I think there's some great things that could happen from this, but I think there's also some bad things that could happen. Yeah. So have you seen your clients doing this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw some of these. So talk about these. I'll talk about some of our experiences. Okay. So, so the, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? You save time. So we can be spending so much less time and money doing the prep in Asia. Like, well, I'm talking about probably I would have about 90% savings because labor is so much cheaper there. And yes, the labor market is growing. It's getting uh, more expensive to produce in Asia because they have an internal consumption happening yeah. in that market. But uh, we can save so much money. Here's the pushback, though, is that by essentially having them do the prep and do all the workflow and FBA prep in China, sending direct to Amazon, whether it's UK or Canada or the United States, we're essentially giving them the secret sauce of the business. Yeah. Right? They're knowing who our customer is. That's the next one, I think. So they're, they're knowing who our customer is. You're telling your vendor who your customer is, who you're selling to. Yeah. So they know they're yeah they're pretty much watching you watching you works they know what you're selling who you're selling it to but not are they watching right they're actually doing it so you're training you're literally training a competitor 
Yeah, yeah, this is something that I'm struggling with personally. So they can just cut you out. So you've done all this work to cut out other middlemen, and all of a sudden, I'm like, well, you know what? I know what he's selling, where he's selling. I can make it cheaper because I make it, and then I mark up to sell them. I could just pass the, uh, that. Uh, I can use, you know, leverage their kind of scale and go directly to the channel. And there's certain softwares out there. I know World First helps help sell Chinese sellers come to the United States, right? Mm-hmm. You give them these bank accounts that they can't natively get yeah. in China. Uh, we have some sellers on Scubana that are, have no footprint in the United States, no like feet on the ground here, yeah. but they are uh, selling through 3PLs and through FBA in the United States, but sitting overseas in Shanghai mm-hmm. or in Guangzhou. Yeah, so and one thing, yeah, I mean, we do, uh, we have a, like, a lot of Chinese-based uh, uh, clients of ours, but what we've noticed with them is these guys are going directly in the U.S., and that's pretty much a lot of times that's all, all they care about. So when you're going into Europe, a lot of those Chinese sellers, not to say they're not there, but the vast majority of them are going into the U.S. and not into in Europe. Mm-hmm. So that's one good thing about, about you know, going directly to Europe. Two, let's say you're a European-based uh, vendor. They'll actually send it from the from their uh, manufacturer to an FBA prep uh, in the U.S., mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll forward it on, too. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. So they're never touching it. Yes, there's an FBA prep happening that's happening they're selling it to Yep. So, yeah. The barriers to entry in the United States marketplace are torn down. Like there is. Let's just pick it up after the the uh, the good, bad, the ugly. Yeah. So the good, the bad, the ugly. You are telling the vendor who your customer is. So that I think we went through this. Yeah. Telling the customer, you're telling them exactly how you do your prep, who you're shipping to, where your selling channel is on. Yeah. Where your margin is. Exactly. Yeah, because they can then just go and find your products, you know, listed there too. Right. Like the company name. Yep, you're training them to, on how to be you. So you don't want to get cut out of the equation. So that's, so that's kind of happening to you now then? Well, we're just, right now, internally, we're like deciding if that's an approach we want to go, because I think that we're leaving a lot of money on the table by right. having it come to the United States, then go and shipping. The FBA, yeah. and if some of that inventory is sitting in my US warehouse, I can probably be splitting that up and having less inventory sitting uh, in my warehouse in the United States. Yeah, so, well, here's it. What about this? So, everybody talk, like a lot of folks do these sourcing trips, and a lot of folks who have, who have been in business a long time, and like you've been in China. Mm-hmm. So, you go out there and you meet these manufacturers. I mean, at what level do you trust the, those guys enough? They're, they're not going to do that. Or you feel comfortable they're not going to do that. Yeah, so one of the first things I do when I'm talking to a factory is I have them give me a FaceTime or Skype video of their, of their factory. Yeah. So there's nothing like going to China and actually drinking whiskey with the factory manager yeah. and the people that are on the floor. Yeah. So I think that's the best way. Like when you exchange a business card in China, it's with two, two hands. hands. Two, exactly. Yeah. And there's... That handshake and going out and doing karaoke, which they call KTV, yeah. and going out for a foot massage with them, and going to dinner and breaking bread. Yeah, the the, the, the Chinese word for it is guanxi. It's oh. like the guanxi, so it's like establishing that rapport, that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the positive version, the, the positive version of saving face and uh, the relationships. I mean, you have to look at the ROI. It's going to cost you a few grand going there all in, you know, flights and everything. But if you're doing you're running a multi-million dollar business, then all of a sudden, uh, a few grand to ensure that uh, you had a good relationships worth it. So exactly. So I think there's tons of ROI and benefit by by going over there. Yeah, drinking with them. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out is to bundle and test the market. So you can essentially double or triple your SKU count by actually bundling your items. So if we actually are making, let's just say we're making a, uh, a vacuum filter. Mm-hmm. So you do a one pack, or you can do a two pack, four pack, an eight pack, 10 pack, and 12 pack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can bundle, triple your SKU count, which triples your actual real estate space you're taking up on Amazon and even international. Okay, so okay, so you have them listed. The only thing that changes is the, the quantity or the amount, basically. Yeah, but you're just creating separate listings for the quantity. Exactly. So they're not variations, yeah, they're okay. actually net new SKUs. Okay, perfect. So then what you can do is you can actually do what we call bundle breakdowns. You can do this through Skibana. I don't know if there's other softwares out there that can do it. I just know how a lot of our customers are using it today. You can actually sell a product, merchant fulfilled, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Use Skibana and break down the bundle. Click a button, it'll break it down to the core items. And then you send that off to Amazon BA to fulfill. 
And so this allows you to test the market without the velocity yet, without actually having to push your product into Amazon's FBA warehouse and have it just sitting there forever. Right? You don't want to just have inventory, storage fees, yeah, storage yeah. fees et cetera, where you get killed in the four and four queue. Yeah. So this is a way to test the market. And sometimes two packs and four packs do better than one packs. And actually sometimes we play with the way that we've structured the listing and the titles and the descriptions. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes people will pay $7 for a one pack of vacuum belts, but a two pack will pay nineteen ninety five. So immediately out of the gate, you're testing, but you're also increasing your average order value, your AOV. So what have you seen, so if you, I mean, it's, I guess it's a tough question to ask, but what do you think is better for a business? Is it variations or, or is it multiple SKUs? So that is a controversial, controversial existential question. Yeah. Uh, some people say variations are better. Yeah. Because you essentially retain the reviews in one listing. Yep. And yeah, yeah. You did that. You're pumping a lot of traffic and conversion to that listing. Amazon's going to reward you for it. Yep. But on the reverse, we're seeing sellers that actually create net new SKUs with new UPC codes and with kits and bundles yeah. and actually are uh, winning much more in that approach than on the variation approach because you're, you're getting more real estate space. Well, yeah, for sure. So I, mean, I guess uh, if you're above the fold and you have three, there, I don't even know, depending on your screen resolution, what you're looking at or how you're doing, you may see what four, four different products above yeah. the fold. If you own half of them, you're doubling your real estate. Yep. So yeah, I guess two schools of thought, but it would be, that would be an interesting sort of test to run. I mean, I think it'll be there's so many variations because there you can't really compare it because the pricing can be different, the products can be different. Yeah, but it's but yeah, the it's personal share for me is that yeah. we're not doing variations; we're just creating net new Yeah. So okay. so uh, we talked about the bundle breakdown using FBA stocks to fill it. This is one way you can do the bundle breakdown if you're looking at my screen. Do you see it? Uh, one more, one, one more. more. There we go. Yeah. So you do the bundle breakdown, do a Subana, again, triple your SKUs overnight. So those are really good. Sorry about the, the technical, technical difficulties, guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jason, you want to go through your power offer with whoever's on the. On yeah, the yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I know some, some of the folks may have. Uh, you know, left, come back. First off, if you guys have any questions, you can reach directly out to me. That's that's all my contact info. So anything I can do to help or answer questions, or even point you in the direction of somebody who could do something that we can't, let me know. But in terms of what we're offering to every client is, uh, regardless of it, whether you become our client or not, um, you know, for free, we'll do a full analysis and breakdown of any sort of outgoing payments internationally. You know, what you're being charged. Uh, what savings could look like, and also the reverse, which is collecting revenue overseas from Amazon or other marketplaces. We can show you uh, what you're being charged and what the cost of doing business like that is and then what your savings could be. But I think, yeah, the power nugget here is anybody who's based in a country and selling on Amazon or any other marketplace in another country, uh, you can be saving a lot of money with really, you know, five, ten minutes of setup. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we're, what we're here to offer. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. Yeah. Uh, as for me, uh, if we go to the screen, Andrew, uh, you can contact me, reach out if you have any questions. If you want a free 15-minute consultation to go over your international strategy and how you're doing things today and how you could be doing things differently, uh, feel free to sign up and apply. Uh, the first 10 people to, to sign up will win. So go to skibana.com slash gold. The password is nuggets. Apply, feel free to email me, tweet me, hit me up on Instagram. There's all my contact details there. I'm very accessible and I want to help everybody that joins today uh, in any way I can. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for joining all the way from Austin. All the way from Austin. Jason, everybody. Thanks. I do have one question for someone. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, is it even worth shipping slash selling to Mexico? The customs fees are so high that nobody wants their order when it arrives, if it arrives. Well, I think, uh, I think the, what you should do is if you're going to ship to Mexico, you should look at some like uh, the D, I think it's DDP solution, delivery duties paid. That way, that customer, when it goes to them, it's already inclusive of all costs. So uh, depending on the marketplace you're selling on, um, a lot of how you ship, there are a lot of companies out there that will actually 
And the reason why, for those who are in America, probably have never had that happen where, you know, you, you, the, the FedEx guy delivers something and then he's like, oh, wow, well, you owe me 10 bucks. Mm. That's what will happen in Mexico and some other places. But too. if you, do it, you ship directly to the FBA, yeah. you're not going to run to that issue. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So right, right there. And if you have your own, if you're selling other markets that don't have FBA, see if FBA can fulfill for them. And if not, if you just find a 3PL or a courier service that does uh, delivery duties paid, when it arrives, every uh, every dollar is already accounted for. They're not going to have to pay anything else. Great. How do you set up a world first account to have Amazon Canada payments sent to a U.S. bank? Uh, yeah, it's a teed up question. <laughs> um, for, first By the way, we didn't tee it up. <laughs> actually we're actually not going jokingly. Yeah, somebody teed it up, but it was no. But, but no, layout. Layout, there we go. Layout, not a tee up. Um, it's really simple. So uh, we can send a link around after this um, for anybody who wants to register for an account. It's free. Uh, once you, we'll ask you for a few documents to get your account, you know, vetted and authorized, and then we issue your your uh, your account details, and then we'll show you exactly how you can put them into Canada, and they may offer ask for a proof of ownership statement, which is great because we can easily provide that. Um, I know a lot of other companies can't. Um, so anytime you change anything on Amazon, sometimes or sometimes they'll uh, ask you to verify. It. Easy to do it, uh, help you verify, it. and then your next disbursement. Uh, you, you can it'll be right in your world first account, so you can then choose to bring it right back whenever you want to you to your US dollar account. Great. Now there was a new nugget that was brought to my attention recently uh, that I wanted to share that I completely left off this presentation, which was, and I thought this was interesting. This has nothing to do with the Q&A question, but someone was telling me that you can actually start looking and analyzing how you're importing into the United States if you are importing to the US. And based on the HTS code, or however you describe, I would think HTS or a certain code, how you describe your goods, can you actually dictate your, your bracket for taxes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So somebody I was talking to imports in Santa Claus costumes, and the Santa Claus costumes, one has Velcro on it, and one doesn't. There's two different codes for that. If you have a good with Velcro, there's actually a tax of I forgot what the percentage is. So if you don't have Velcro, there's a much lower tax. Who you want to go after helps because, of course, I don't think the, the government's going to get that crazy about you know, which Santa Claus outfit yeah. you're bringing to the country. But I think that's just yeah. something to really look into when you're importing if you are paying duties to check that out. Yeah, and the thing too is a lot of times too, it's not like you're trying to take advantage of it as much as like you know just do your homework because you can have something that's like like uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like it could just be pet. You know, but if you get in there, you realize that like like pet dog food might actually have a different uh, tax bracket than actually doing a dog leash. So if you're doing a dog leash and you have it just on, on a higher level code, um, you actually could be giving away more money when it's not actually what you're even selling. So it's just doing your research. That's really cool. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.